Go get him, Tiger. Hey! Who said animated movies were just for kids? That definitely isn't the case when it comes to the Despicable Me universe, not when the minions are involved. On the outside, Universal creates the perfect family film. But take a closer look and the franchise has plenty of scenes that were explicitly made for adults. And a lot of them aren't even subtle. Number 1. His Famous Robe Hugh Hefner isn't the first person that comes to mind when you think family-friendly, but the famous Playboy founder did make an appearance in the Minions Rise of Gru, just not in the way that you're probably thinking. Of course, Universal couldn't just have Hugh Hefner make a cameo. Number 1. He isn't alive anymore. And number 2. That would be wildly inappropriate. But in the scene that takes place in Gru's childhood bedroom, Stuart hops into bed wearing Hefner's infamous red robe. A joke for the adults and one that probably flew over the majority of kids' heads. Welcome to possibilities of other ways of living your life. Number 2. More than a massage. Before the minions get to take Master Chow's martial arts boot camp, they're welcomed into her studio, her massage studio, where she's working on a client. But in comes Stuart again with his not so clean mind with the line. Uh, kung fu? Bur, smoochie, smoochie. He's also gesturing between the two and therefore implying that there may be a little more than a massage about to happen. But Master Chow is quick to shut down his innuendo with some real technique. I will teach you. Number 3. Dress Up Gone Wrong for the Minions, it isn't unusual for them to don some elaborate costumes in order to execute a plan or just simply have fun. But one costume malfunction in Rise of Gru probably left some adults with raised eyebrows. One of the Minions, while dressed as a woman, loses a tennis ball from its chest. It was definitely put into the film to cut some tension between the Minions and the Vicious Six demanding to know Gru's location. However, it was definitely a moment made to pull some laughs from the non-child audience members. Yeah! Number 4. An Epic Cameo Believe it or not, not every adult scene in the Despicable Me universe is inappropriate. Sometimes there are just references that anyone born before the year 2000 just wouldn't understand. For example, in Rise of Gru, we get a hilarious cameo from famous 70s stuntman Evil Knievel. While a minion on a tricycle outcycling someone on a motorcycle is funny all by itself, for adults, it's even more humorous when they recognize Evil Knievel's signature outfit and then his infamous number on the ramp a few seconds later. Number 5. A Toy for the Adults Rise of Gru takes place in the 70s, so it was only natural that the creators incorporate elements that people born in that time era would understand, also known as the adults. So, before all the tablets and cell phones and even Wii's, there was the Pet Rock. Yes, the same Pet Rock that Otto traded the Vicious Six Magic Stone for when he crashed a kid's birthday party. So to children watching the film, it may have just looked like a rock with googly eyes, but for some adults in the audience, it was a definite blast from the past. For a pet rock! Number 6. Nixon vs. Kennedy Just like the pet rock, there's another instance in Rise of Gru that only adults will get. When Gru auditions for the Vicious Six, he sees a villain holding a copy of the magazine Mad. On the front, the image is a poster congratulating Nixon for winning as president, and the back is congratulating John F. Kennedy on his presidential campaign. So unless a child is really versed in US history, they probably wouldn't pay any attention to the magazine. And to take it a step further, adults would probably realize it's impossible for both of these events to be happening at the same time. Not to mention the film takes place in the 70s, but these events occurred in the 60s. Number 7. A jab at real life people. Whoever said the Despicable Me universe was unrealistic? If you've watched the films, you know that the infamous Bank of Evil pops up quite often throughout the movies. But have you ever really looked at the bank's sign? Right underneath its name, it reads, Formerly Lehman Brothers. While that would basically be gibberish to children, adults probably remember the real-life Lehman Brothers. It was a financial service in the United States that holds the record for undergoing the biggest bankruptcy ever. Number 8. Wardrobe Malfunction In the first Minions film, the Minions take a trip to the Tower of London, where they have to triple up in order to pass as adults and get tickets. Of course, one of the Minions' goggles doubles as a woman's chest, which leads to a very awkward confrontation and stare contest with the local mime. A staring contest that only adults would really understand. Ooh, the man. Number 9. Cat Calls and Engine Noises The Minions may have game in the streets, but they also have game in the she... er... we... meaner... 
when it comes to flirting. From the engine revving to the toothpick and what are essentially catcalls from the minions, this scene definitely wasn't meant for children's eyes. While anyone under the age of 13 probably thought the minions were having some good old fun, we all know better and can see and hear the underlying meaning. Number 10. Fun with the copy machine. Adults having a little too much fun with the copy machine at an office party is a go-to gag for an R-rated or at least 14A rated comedy. But despite the Despicable Me family-friendly audience, the creators decided having a scene like this in the film was a great idea. In this moment, the minions continuously scan their butts and think it's hilarious. And while kids probably got a sense of what was going on, this moment was definitely meant to make the older audiences chuckle. Number 11. Stewart had a little too much fun. When Bob is declared king in Minions, of course his pals, including Stuart, would take full advantage of all the perks, including the large bathtub that really should be considered a pool. The first adult scene we get from this film is when Stuart strips down to basically nothing, wearing an outfit that is very mature-esque to take a dip. The next scene is him in the actual pool, putting on a pretty adult-themed show with two fire hydrants. Yes, fire hydrants. Number 12. Hypnotic Dancing Let's take it back to the time when the minions were at the Tower of London. After a successful disguise and getting into the actual tower, the three friends are tasked with having to get by the guards. And what better way to do that than by hypnotizing them? However, you'd think they'd hypnotize them to sleep or something. Nope. Instead, the guards start performing a pretty inappropriate dance while basically nude, which probably shouldn't have been shown to really little kids if we're all being honest. Number 13. A big adult party. What could go wrong when you round up a couple hundred minions and bring them to the beach? Not much, besides a lot of adult activity, which in a way is kind of realistic. This beach scene in Despicable Me 2 is full of background moments you have to squint to see. Background moments that include flirting, skinny dipping, and and even makeout sessions. Number 14. Staring into the camera like The Office. Gru's wedding to Lucy is beautiful. Between the minions serenading and the girls' speeches, truly heartwarming. However, during the couple's first dance, if you pay attention to the surrounding minions, you'll see something happening that doesn't quite belong. If you look in the right bottom corner, you'll see a minion looking at a guest's behind and then glancing knowingly at the camera while sticking their tongue out and making a face. Just like characters on The Office. Number 15. The Minions Security Check In Despicable Me 3, the Minions find themselves in jail, a jail that they basically run, and in jail they have to go through some security protocols including searches. So while this scene where one Minion pulls down his pants and shows another Minion his behind may seem like a joke to a child, adults know that this is a common procedure for searching for illegal substances and weapons in actual prisons. Not too shabby. Excuse me, ma'am. While the OG Pinocchio was definitely designed for kids, there are quite a few moments in Disney Plus's new live-action Pinocchio that would go right over kids' heads. We've got all the scenes that were definitely made for adults in the audience. Let's go. Oh yeah? Watch this. Number 1. You probably caught this line that Jiminy Cricket said to the Blue Fairy about making a boy. And if you didn't, prepare to look at Jimmy a little differently. When the fairy asks why Geppetto made a puppet when he wanted a real boy, Jiminy argued that this was probably as close to making a real boy as Geppetto could actually get. He says, Sure, there are other ways to make a boy, but I don't think Geppetto gets out much. Jiminy, we think we speak for all of us when we say that no one really wants to think of Tom Hanks's Geppetto that way. Of course, I'm just a talking cricket, so I'm not one to pass judgment on what's real. Number two. We can all admit that it's pretty funny to see Pinocchio drinking from a beer stein. And the joke here was definitely for the grown-ups. Throughout his time at Pleasure Island, Pinocchio is drinking root beer, but he's drinking it from a beer stein, so it definitely looks like he's drinking actual beer. This is made even more true when he's sitting in a bar drinking it while playing pool. Later, when he sees Lampwick growing donkey ears, he moves his glass away and looks at it as if he's had too much to drink, and that's what's causing him to see animal parts growing on his friends. Lampy! You might want to check What do I look like to you? A jackass! 
It begs the question, was this root beer that looks like beer? Or was Pinocchio having a particularly pleasurable time at Pleasure Island because he was having a few beers? That may be for the adults to know and for the kids to find out. Uh -huh. Either way, Pinocchio still seemed to have his wits about him. Number 3. Jiminy Cricket has a moment with a doll that is far from smooth. And since there is the possibility in this world of dolls being able to communicate freely with crickets, it's safe to say that she was probably not too happy. Jiminy accidentally leans on dolls behind and then proceeds to talk to her awkwardly. Oh, yeah. excuse me, ma'am. Part of this joke definitely lies in the doll's fixed facial expression, which seems thoroughly offended. And while it's not actually in reaction to what Jiminy does, since this doll hasn't had anything to do with the Blue Fairy, she'd be totally in the right if she were mad. Number 4. It was pretty surprising to hear a talking fox make a reference to Chris Pine, but we liked this joke nonetheless. And we have a feeling the other adults watching did too. When Honest John is suggesting different wood-related stage names, Slab Oakley. Chad Log? He thinks of Chris Pine as a potential name for a boy made of pine. Chris Pine! Nah, it'd never work. And it would be a pretty good pick if it wasn't already taken by someone super famous. Number 5. Did you notice the name of the store on Pleasure Island? It's called Shop and Lift. This store name is pretty obviously based on the famous grocery chain Stop and Shop. But in this case, it seems to be a place where kids shoplift rather than shop. Not the best business model. But it's got a great name and probably a fun place for a bunch of kids who love wreaking havoc. Number 6. We tend to think of the word crap as an already family-friendly version of a swear word. But Disney went ahead and g rating fight it a little. Apcray! Lampwick says Apcray, which, of course, is the Pig Latin version of crap. It sure has been an Anglais aimte since we heard Pig Latin. Number 7. In another case of an already fairly family friendly word turned even more family friendly, one scene included the age old term H E double hockey sticks. When Jiminy goes down the drain, he says, It's like I've dropped into H E double hockey stick. The kids get what that term means? It probably depends on the age, but it's safe to say it's one of those things they'll be repeating whether they understand it or not. Number 8. This one is something that was definitely for the adults and was pretty surprising to hear coming from a talking cricket. Jiminy Cricket? Temporary conscience? Well then. When Jiminy sees a gravel road, he tells Pinocchio that the road is dangerous and is surely going to cause an accident. He says, What in Sam Hill do we pay taxes for? What are taxes? Nothing you need to worry about. It's hard not to wonder how much Jiminy Cricket would pay in taxes, and how much he's getting paid for being a puppet's conscience. But it kind of feels like we're having a fever dream when we think too deeply about this movie. Number 9. Honest John is pretty hellbent on making Pinocchio a star. When he's listing the ways that Pinocchio might become a star, he suggests that he should be an influencer. Adults definitely know that becoming an influencer is a popular way to become a star. He's a natural born actor, right, Gideon? Nay, an influencer! And sure, it might even work for a magic puppet. Number 10. Whether he's an influencer, an actor, or anything else, Honest John is dying to become Pinocchio's agent. Jiminy wisely tells Pinocchio, Pinocchio, as a rule of thumb, when somebody calls themselves honest, they ain't. Then he adds a bit that's definitely for the grown-ups and says, Especially if they're an agent. Number 11. In one scene, Geppetto believes that Pinocchio is ready to go to school, but when he explains how the sun works to his puppet son, it's pretty clear that Geppetto should probably take some classes too. Geppetto says that the sun revolves around the Earth a few times a day and calls it simple science. That is the sun, my son. It goes around the Earth once a day. Got it, father! Of course, that's not really how it works, and since Pinocchio never actually made it to school, he's gonna have to take Geppetto's word for it. Number 12. Judging by the rest of Pleasure Island, the island school was sure to be very, very different from your average school. Fittingly, this school is called D-grade school. Get it? Like a degrading version of a grade school? Of course, this school seems less about learning and more about destroying things. So again, very fitting. Number 13. Of course, there are certain words that you simply cannot say if you want to maintain that PG rating. That doesn't mean, however, that there's never a time when writers may want their characters to say those off-limits words. What the cuss is that all about? Since Jiminy Cricket is the movie's narrator and talks directly to the audience, Jiminy's use of cuss is definitely a little wink to the viewers. Number 14. Jiminy Cricket cussing is not the only time this film manages to sneak a little profanity into its otherwise 
totally kid-friendly tale. On Pleasure Island, when Lampwick starts to turn into a donkey, What do I look like to you? A jackass! <laughs> In any context that wasn't donkey related, this word would have definitely been a no-go for a kid's script. But the donkey double meaning allowed this language to work. Number 15. Sophia says, Who knew they were outsourcing conscience work? Back in my day. Sophia! This one will definitely go over kids' heads. But the grown-ups in the audience are sure to think of this as a cute crossover between real life and a fairy tale world. Number 16. In yet another attempt to become Pinocchio's agent, Honest John tries to turn him against the teacher that turned him away. He jokingly suggests that he's not a good teacher anyway and asks if the teacher's curriculum is child-led or brain-based for a growth mindset. His pedagogy is completely outdated. Is his curriculum child-led? Brain-based for a growth mindset? Number 17. When he's performing, Pinocchio rubs his wooden shoes against the wooden stage so hard that he starts a fire. He uses this wooden boy exclusive talent again at the film's climax. We did it, Father! Look at all that smoke! But this would probably be lost on any little ones who don't know how to start a fire, or the many trials and talents that would come along with being made of wood. Number 18. When Jiminy says, Hot dog! We did it! Pinocchio asks what a hot dog is. Watch that! No time to explain charcuterie, pal! Sure, Pinocchio has to learn about everything. He was just born. But Jiminy could definitely explain barbecue fare without going into charcuterie. You know, in a way that all the kids watching would understand. It's like a crime scene in my mouth. Gravity Falls may have been a Disney Channel show, but fans know that that doesn't mean it's just for kids. There were plenty of moments in this beloved series that left adults laughing and kids scratching their heads. We've got them all, so let's get into it. Uh, oh no! A letter rip! What the H? Number 1. We've all heard of drug smuggling, and now we've heard of pug smuggling. <laughs> yes, that version is much more kid-friendly and also much more adorable. In one episode, Grunkle Stan says, All right, Santiago, you have 24 hours to get these pugs across the U.S. border. While handing some barrels of pugs. No te preocupas. Vamos, vamos! Yes, this is cute for kids and also funny for adults who get that double meaning. Number two, this puberty book is not for children. Grunkle Stan tells Dipper that it's time to learn about the birds and the bees. Guess it's time you and me had a man-to-man -man talk about the birds and the bees, you know? He then gives him a book about puberty titled, Why Am I Sweaty? Then he tells him where babies come from. Now you know where babies come from. Goodbye, childhood. And we're just hoping that this didn't leave kids watching this episode saying the same thing because it made them ask their parents questions. He may be little, but he has big plans. <laughs> Number three. Fully Clothed Women Magazine is a kid-friendly play on that kind of magazine. One episode involves Dipper finding a box of magazines that, let's just say kids probably wouldn't understand the nature of. Ew, pretending I never saw that. The collection includes one magazine titled Fully Clothed Women. Number four, it sounds like Dipper's internet history may have some things in it that aren't exactly G-rated. Mabel makes a joke about the creepy nature of Dipper's internet search history, and we can only imagine what that involves. This room is way creepy. Not as creepy as Dipper's internet history. Hey! <gasps> Number five, we all know a certain gesture you can't make in a kid's show. Well, Grunkle Stan wishes he could make it. What happened to your hand? So I might have got cursed a little. When Grunkle Stan is cursed by a witch and loses his hands as a result, he says that he wants them back so he can make a certain gesture. Can I have my hands back? I have a certain gesture I'd like to share with you. For those of us who know the gesture he's referring to, we know he wouldn't have been able to actually do it on the Disney Channel, hands or no hands. Number six. Shaky and Scratchy may not sound like inappropriate names, but boy are they. Stan says that his hands are named Shaky and Scratchy. Shaky, Scratchy. I've missed you, old rascals! Don't think too deeply about what he's shaking and what he's scratching, or you'll be scarred. Number seven, time to do shots. Wait, isn't Mabel a little young for that? When Mabel gets sad, she takes shots of orange juice to make her feel better. Sure, you can drink orange juice if you're under 21, but the way she's hunched over that table sure makes it seem like she's been to a bar before. I need something to get my mind off this. Number eight. You can't swear for real on the Disney Channel. Okay, okay, okay. I know I have a lot of explaining to do. We all know that won't stop good old Grunkle Stan from trying, though. In one episode, Stan stubs his toe and says, Hot Belgian waffles! Before realizing that since he's alone, he can swear for real. I can swear for real! <gasps> Son of a...
Number 9. Blackmail is not for kids. Especially this kind. Mabel snaps a picture of Dipper giving CPR to a mermaid and giggles, saying it's going to be blackmail. <gasps> Not very sisterly of you, Mabel. <laughs> Number 10. Was that a fairy dust deal? Where do you get this stuff? Yes, we had pug smugglers and now we have fairy dust dealers. In this episode, an exchange of fairy dust and butterflies in a forest looks a lot like a drug deal. Everyone lacks sausage, but no one lacks to know how it's made. In fact, it actually looks like a sting operation, considering the fact that the gnome police and deer cop car show up and send the fairy dust dealer away to deal with the adorable owl judge. Then the cop asks for his cut from the customer, so she was in on it all along. You disgust me! Pretty clever stuff. Number 11, Mabel's tripping on candy. In one scene, Mabel has too much candy and starts having pretty wild hallucinations. Mabel, how many of these did you eat? 11. Make sure to always check your Halloween candy before you eat it, kids. You don't want to end up like Mabel. What do you think? You could end up chewing on a giant dog's paws. Number 12, Dipper and Wendy share a rather awkward moment. Dipper, you gotta check out this weird metal closet. Sure, even kids can tell that this is an uncomfortable situation, but they definitely don't know the extent of it. We all know that Dipper has a major crush on Wendy. Well, when they get stuck in the decontamination room, they're thrown together and the height difference between them lands Dipper face planting in a very specific way. At this time, Dipper definitely looks at Wendy's chest, but the look is pretty subtle. Interestingly though, this scene was actually supposed to be longer and even more awkward, but it was cut down. We're assuming that was taking things just a little too far out of family-friendly territory. Number 13. When Sue says there sure are a lot of stars out tonight, it's time to get out of there fast. In one scene, Sue's and Grunkle Stan are in the car and Sue's takes his shirt off and comments on the stars. Sure are a lot of stars out tonight. This is definitely a reference to a line someone might say to make things a little more romantic. Well, this is getting weird. Number 14. Welcome to the Woodstick Festival. If you're an adult, you know that the Woodstick Festival is a play on Woodstock. Most kids wouldn't understand the Woodstick pun, nor would they notice the love god's fairly blatant drug paraphernalia. Let's make some miracles happen! Groupies, bedhead me! It seems you can hide something in plain sight if no one knows what they're looking for, even if it's a bong in a kid-friendly show. Who would have thought? Number 15. Does Boys to Infants sound familiar? At Woodstick, a band called Boys to Infants is set to perform. For adults who notice this name on the lineup, they'll all know that it's a play on Boys to Men, but, you know, backwards. Number 16. Two things that are rarely kid-friendly. Scary movies and Stan. Like these spooky movies! In this episode, Stan talks about how scary movies are good for snuggling, and how that quickly transitions into having a child. You watch the movie, the girl snuggles up next to you, next thing you know you gotta raise a kid, your life falls apart. Jeez, Stan, maybe keep those thoughts to yourself? Forget that last part. Number 17. What exactly is the murder hut? Well, according to this newspaper clipping, the mystery shack used to be called Murder Hut. I have some questions about all this myself, Stanley. No, we have no idea why this is, and no, we do not want to find out. Number 18. This psycho reference is definitely for adults. Frankly, so are all psycho references. This one, though, is specifically for the extra eagle-eyed psycho fans. Did you notice that this house is actually modeled after Norman Bates' house? Yeah, we didn't either, and we're pretty confident that kids also didn't catch this nod. Number 19. Did you notice a subtle Donnie Darko reference? For Summer Ween, Robbie dresses just like Donnie Darko, and it made us want to ask, what are you doing in that stupid Donnie Darko suit? How many kids today have ever seen Donnie Darko? We're guessing close to none. Not surprised you didn't hear about it. There isn't anybody else I'd rather go around blowing stuff up with. There are a million and ten moments from the Cuphead show that are definitely not kid-friendly. Take it off and I'll give you ten bucks! Cursing, dirty jokes, violence, and homages to old tropes that were better left buried. We're looking at all the terrible moments kids might not have understood. Number one. We're starting off this thing with a bang. 
While the Cuphead show is rated 7+, we can't help but feel that age is low, and here's why. Bull Boy literally shattered, and we were led to believe he was a goner. But in true cartoon fashion, of course he came back. Why we felt this differs from something like the Looney Tunes is we're led to believe that he really met his demise. Number two, does the shady piano teacher deserve what's coming? While this is an age-old trope, dropping pianos on characters with these malicious intentions are usually not seen in children's shows these days. Mugman tried to drop the piano on his brother Cuphead. Of course, his teacher takes the brunt of the damage after stealing Cuphead's song and spotlight. Number three. Ice cream, you scream. We all scream for the ice cream man to just go away. And out of the realm of tropes, which to some degree we forgive because homages are just classic, the villainous side of Mugman gets super dark. This ends now! He tries to take out the ice cream man for playing his ice cream music too loud. Then it's implied that the ice cream man wants to run Mugman over. Of course, in comedic fashion, that turns out to be a twist for comedy's sake, but we are still left to believe it, even if just for a moment. Number four, poor Elder Kettle just isn't shiny anymore. It's time to donate him. Misunderstanding the scenario of the boys mourning a dying worm, Elder Kettle thinks they want to put him out of his misery and bury him in the yard. We'll make it quick and painless. <laughs> Number five, kitchen shears are handy sometimes. They're just one of the many weapons in this show. After being dropped by his music teacher, Mugman feels a deep-seated desire to destroy the talent of his brother. Cuphead can't play in the recital if he doesn't have any hands. <laughs> Number six, the devil incinerated a bunch of demons. You can't tell us that's kid-friendly. Number seven. And speaking of fire, he sets the entire city on fire. Lost my touch? I think not. You know who else likes to set fires, though? Elder Kettle, who is an arsonist. Doesn't sound like a children's show when you phrase it like that, huh? There are some baby pics we would like to burn to Elder Kettle. <laughs> Number eight. Impossible isn't the word for it. So when Cuphead finds himself a new brother, he and Bull Boy literally drown themselves for fun and then ride on top of a train. Yes, we did see this in Aladdin, at least the drowning part, but something about it just screams not for kids. Number nine, the Cuphead show is far more than just violent. It's also downright creepy. Between the Baroness and Chalice's ghostly scare, there's lots that can freak kids out. However, one moment in particular wins the cake. Elder Kettle becomes the grudge. And that movie is definitely not for children. Number 10. Sometimes just the language of the characters is foul enough. From antiquated curse words that slipped off the radar to dark analogies, Cuphead is definitely throwing a bone to an older audience. Our chances of survival are slim to none. And Slim just drowned. Winter is a merciless killer. Well, you don't have to be such a- Number 11. Stabby things can be spotted in nearly every episode. There's a colorful array of weapons in the show. From kitchen cheers to ice cream cones to pitchforks to explosives and makeshift cannons, the show's full of violence. Number 12. The morality of the characters is one huge factor of the Cuphead show that sets it apart from other children's shows. There's no good moral character. Mugman is the closest this show comes, but that's out of his own cowardice. The characters are cruel, vindictive, thieving bullies. While moments of goodness shine through in the characters from time to time, they're still all seriously awful. And that's part of the show's charm. Number 13. Our parents didn't listen when we told them vegetables were bad. One seriously obvious moment from season one that was not meant for children was the raging party the vegetables threw. Water was a stand-in for alcohol, obviously, and uh, we just can't help but find it weird they were drinking through their uh, nether regions. Not that veggies have nether regions, but you know, you give them a few human characteristics and it's hard to ignore. Maybe one last sip for the road. 
Number 14. This saucy number was definitely not made for kids. There's a moment where Mugman tries to seduce the German rat by dressing his hand up like Swiss cheese. Number 15. It's quite understandable for your girlfriend to be jealous if sentient spaghetti is making love to your face. So, are you gonna introduce me to your little friend? Number 16. Love is messy. Oddly, the Cuphead show reflects it well. Yeah, it's love on the rocks. <laughs> Get it? Everything about Captain Briny Beard's relationship with the sea monster was very adult. It's cause I love ya, baby! Don't call me baby. Love is tough. Number 17. The Baroness puts Hansel and Gretel to shame. Okay, we could be coming up with this all in our own heads, but this doesn't seem appropriate to us. Ain't you gonna eat my sweets? What do you think? Dirty or innocent? Number 18. Sometimes Cuphead and Mugman become man and wife for a moment. Get out! Uh, don't come back until you learn some self-control! Now this moment is totally coded. It is literally the wife kicking the husband out on his butt for drinking too much. Cuphead has the five o'clock shadow made of chocolate to prove it. Number 19. Seriously, for a kid's show, it has weirdly mature breakup scenes. I'll never give up on love. Relationships are a series of peaks and valleys. Now that's a joke for adults. Number 20. That feel when the male person's the only one who can love you. Special delivery for you this time. Mugman, the lonely housewife in his apron with his pie, is flirting with the mailman. No thank you, here's your mail. Number 21. This twin trope can be burned. Where's Elder Kettle when you need him? Sal Spud and the Heirloom Sisters are embracing another one, guys. Sal is trying to get with a set of twin tomatoes. Naughty, naughty. Number 22. And now for the episode that's title is shamelessly ripping off the Looney Tunes. That's all, folks. The episode Rats All, Folks is really leaning into replicating anti-war propaganda with a German rat going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the retired war vet Elder Kettle. This propaganda was popular among cartoonists during the war. That included Disney's Donald Duck. Well, well, well. Which will it be? Your precious cottage? Or your precious cups? Number 23. It's about time we get thrown in the slammer. Morning, Lefty. Got that blood out of your jumpsuit. Everything about the opening episode of season two is rife with stuff not suitable for children. Lock picking, the electric chair, more explosives. Yeah, we would have loved this show as kids too. I didn't make it. <laughs> Ugh. Number 24. In the episode where Bull Boy is trying to seem like a daredevil, we don't think it's a coincidence that his nickname, Bolsey, sounds a lot like something else. Number 25. And finally, the references you only understood if you were over the age of how long has Tom Sawyer been out? And the opening of the show is most definitely an homage to Tom Sawyer. The cups trick the devil into painting the fence, which happens in the book. And that is how you paint a fence. I think the word you're searching for is space ranger. The word I'm searching for, I can't say because there's preschool toys present. Getting kind of tense, aren't you? What makes Pixar so great? For starters, the fact that they're able to cater to such a wide range of audiences, including adults. Pixar films are full of inappropriate moments, characters, jokes, and innuendos that only the 18 plus viewers are let in on. Number one, inappropriate tunes. Well, it's singing in lullabies every night. No, 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 I, I haven't. We all know the feeling of desperately wanting to see our favorite band or artist live and not being able to. Why on earth do you want to go so badly? Whether it's because of crazy high ticket prices, no show date in your town, or in the Turning Red gang case, no parent approval, it's hashtag relatable. In Turning Red, we get to hear just how inappropriate some of the girls' moms think Four Town's music is. Abby's mom thought Four Town was just a little too mature for 13-year-olds. Mine called it stripper music! What's wrong with that? <laughs> Number two, an inappropriate bite. During the Portoroso Cup, Luca runs into quite a bit of trouble when they get into the swimming portion of the competition, but he finds a way around exposing his sea creatureness by wearing a heavy duty diving suit and helmet. And while his plan does backfire, it saves him from being the contestant who was attacked by a fish in some pretty private areas. Oh, 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 oh. Ouch, that had to have hurt. 
Number 3. Alluding to Crime Ercole's first encounter with Luca and Alberto isn't exactly a G-rated scene. When he introduces himself, he first compliments their clothes, but ends the comment with, What did you get them? A dead body? <laughs> Dead body. Turning it into not only a backhanded compliment, but insinuating that a potential crime had been committed to get the clothes. Of course, a crime we all know Luca and Alberto are definitely not capable of. Number 4. Afterlife Problems Is this heaven? <laughs> no. In the film Soul, we get to explore the inner workings of Pixar's idea of an afterlife, at least in this universe. And there's one thing we learn, you can be naked in the afterlife. In one scene, we see a soul doing their best to cover up their body while desperately asking where her pants are in Korean. Number 5. Mixed Messages I'm in a body? Why are you in my body? When Joe is in Mr. Mitten's body and 22 is in Joe's, things in Seoul get a little weird, especially in the scene where Joe visits his mother's co-workers. So, as not to raise any suspicion, Joe asks 22 to kiss his mother's friend goodbye like he always would. But 22 didn't get the ritual and ends up kissing her on the mouth. It gets worse. The co-workers start flirting with who they think is Joe, and one even calls him a cougar. Cougar? I knew it. I'll take another kiss when you get back, Joey. A term only adults would understand. Number 6. Stepping on the gas pedal What are you doing? I don't know. Ian couldn't wait to get away from Colt Bronco in this onward scene. And it's with good reason, considering how upset Colt Bronco becomes when the gang does get away. Right as Bronco realizes they've managed to escape, he yells before the scene cuts out. We all know, as adults, what would have come next. Number 7. No Filter Looks like Colt Bronco isn't the only one in Onward who has a bit of a potty mouth. When Corey takes Laurel under her wing to try and help find her boys, the two end up at a pawn shop. It's there where Corey tries to take her sword, paralyzing the pawn shop owner in the process. Laurel's reaction? Swearing. Oh, son of a You killed her! It's okay! Or almost swearing. Number 8. Bathroom Humor there's a lot to discover when we cross into the land of the dead with Miguel in Coco. And Felipe? He helps with that process. Including in this scene after passing the Alabrijes where he says, Watch your step, they make caquitas everywhere. While arguably not only would kids not understand this joke, but non-Spanish speaking adults as well. Caquitas is a slang word for poop. Number 9. Awesome Beats Hector provides great comedic relief throughout Coco. Who doesn't like a visit from Cousin Hector? Including when he breaks into the performance of his song about a woman named Juanita. At one point, he hesitantly sings the lyric, Knuckles. And when Chicharron calls him out on the lyric, Hector says, Lord, Those are the words. There are children present. Many believe the lyric was supposed to be knockers in reference to Juanita's chest. Number 10. Skeletal Nudity Miguel also happens to stumble upon an inappropriate adult reference himself. When exploring the land of the dead, he passes an art class where a naked female skeleton is posing. This is in reference to adult art classes that often have nude models. To say the least, Miguel was embarrassed. Number 11. Life Sayings Things heat up between Cruise and Lightning in Cars 3. And not in that way. The two end up in a pretty intense argument that ends in the two deciding on an epic race. In the midst of this, Lightning yells, Well, life's a beach, and then you drive. This was 100% in reference to the very popular real-life adult saying, Life's a B-word, and then you die. Pixar just made it PG, but still familiar enough that only adults would get it. <laughs> oh, <McCoy. laughs> Thank you. Number 12. A Dirty Derby In another Cars 3 scene, we get another adult joke. Or rather, an inappropriate line. During the demolition derby, Fargame comes really close to lightning and screams, Hey, buddy, get the out of my way! The honk you hear in between that sentence? It was definitely in reference to a pretty popular adult F-word. Yep, Fargame dropped an F-bomb in Cars 3. Number 13. The Talk there comes a time in most kids' lives when they get sat down by their parents who give them the talk. But in Finding Dory, Dory got a little too excited and almost relayed the contents of that conversation to a group of children who weren't quite ready yet, both in the film and probably most of the film's audience watching. Why are we talking about mommies and daddies? Oh, oh. You see, kids, when two fish love each other. And we'll stop right there. Number 14. 
an inappropriate prize. In Brave, during the very competitive archery tournament, audiences and Lord MacGuffin get a little more than they bargained for. After a well-fought tournament, we Dingwall is crowned champion, to which Lord Dingwall reacts by pulling down his pants and exposing his behind to Lord MacGuffin and Lord Macintosh, and yells, Feast your eyes! A sight no one probably actually wants to feast their eyes on. Number 15. Diving into the wrong places the triplets in Brave are the perfect stereotype of how people would expect triplet boys to behave. But when they're turned into a thruple of cubs, things get even more wild. One of the cubs ends up jumping in Maudie's shirt, right in the area where we see very obvious cleavage. To even confirm the inappropriateness of the scene, one brother looks away and the other grins. What is it with Brave and private areas? Number 16. He gets a little too excited. Buzz and Jesse's love story is one for the ages and arguably an iconic part of the Toy Story franchise. But do you remember how their first meeting went? We'll give you a hint. It was slightly awkward and just a tad inappropriate, at least on Buzz's end. After the Space Ranger is completely dumbfounded by the red-haired cowgirl, she pulls off moves so impressive that Buzz's wings pop open. Almost like a reference to what happens to real-life people when they're attracted to someone. I don't understand why you're not getting this. The folks behind kids' movies know that adults accompany children to the movie theater, so they're always careful to include jokes and references that appeal to the grown-up crowd in the audience. DC League of Super Pets is definitely no exception to this, and this movie is especially good for grown-ups who are big DC fans. These are all the moments in DC League of Super Pets that were made for adults. Number 1. Crypto's book of choice is likely to go way over most kids' heads. In this scene, Crypto and Superman are enjoying some leisure time reading together. Crypto is reading War and Peace. Most kids probably wouldn't think anything of this choice in reading material, other than the fact that a dog reading at all is funny. Adults, on the other hand, know that War and Peace is an especially difficult piece of Russian literature. Crypto must be quite the bibliophile. You ain't normal, man. Number 2. Even Batman wants his royalty checks. In one scene, Superman has a Batman toy for Crypto, and Batman says, That better be a licensed toy or I will freak out. Only adults would understand that Batman wants to get royalties on all his branded merchandise. You've earned it, Batman. We support you. <laughs> that can't be sanitary. Number 3. In DC League of Super Pets, there's an ongoing joke that certain lines have been bleeped out. Movies that aren't designed to be kid-friendly sometimes have words that are deemed inappropriate for children that are bleeped out later to make them kid-friendly. When movies are made for kids, the profanity is generally left out entirely. This movie, on the other hand, proves that somewhere in the middle when certain moments are designed to make it seem like characters are saying expletives. Update! I'm fast now, but I can't see sh while this is obviously geared toward adults, we're guessing that no matter how old you are, watching cute little animals swear is at least a little funny. Number 4. You probably didn't expect to hear the expression going ham in DC League of Super Pets. Not only is the expression going ham a little outdated for kids today, but it's an acronym for a pretty profane expression. It stands for going hard as a Well, you know the rest. Or you can search it on Google. The use of going ham is definitely a joke for the parents only. Number 5. Merton's superhero name is one turtley hilarious pun. When Merton the turtle has superpowers, she's known as Shell on Wheels. This is a play on Hell on Wheels, an expression that would likely go right over most young kids' heads. They explain so much! Number 6. There's a pretty unexpected reference to the Great British Bake Off. Crypto explains how he and Superman have a plan to watch the Great British Bake Off together. Pretty dressed up for the British Bake Off, but you know what? It makes sense. This is the season finale. Kids may know of this very popular series, but this joke will definitely be funnier to the grown-ups watching who know the nature of the series, how popular it is, and the implications of ditching a very wholesome night of TV for a first date. You have a date on Bake Off night? Bad owner! Number 7. Crypto has a strange idea about what FedEx stands for. There's a scene in the movie where Crypto totally misunderstands what FedEx is. When Crypto has never heard of FedEx, he guesses that the name stands for Of course, the Federation of Exes. And claims that such a thing is Not to be trusted. Kids will likely miss this joke, since they probably don't have a reason to distrust Exes. Adults, on the other hand, will definitely get it. 
Number 8. As much as a joke about a dog peeing is perfectly designed for children, the joke about bidets being water fountains for dogs is a little more adult oriented. You were saying something? How much did you have to drink? When Ace is explaining why his bladder is so unusually full, he says he drank from a bidet and explains that it's like a water fountain for dogs. Bidet too, which is, which is crazy. I didn't even know that was a thing, but it's like a dog water fountain. To adults who are familiar with bidets, he makes a valid point. For kids who aren't, they're probably still laughing because there's a peeing dog on screen. Number 9. It's pretty surprising that Crypto is actually a big meme guy. At the start of the movie, Crypto has no idea how to seem like a normal, non-superhero dog. What is new with you, fellow normal dog? He tries and mostly fails to fit in with the others. He even says, fellow kids, when trying to do so. For young kids, this joke will mean nothing. For adults who've spent any amount of time at all on the internet, we know this is a reference to that Steve Buscemi 30 Rock meme. How do you do, fellow kids? Number 10. Merton the Turtle is surprisingly flirty for a cartoon animal. She puts the moves on pretty much anyone or anything that's around. Most children are likely aware that there's something strange about Merton or that she's a bit on the flirty side. Some of Merton's moments, however, are more geared toward adults, like when she finds herself next to a Garfield stuffed animal and tries to make a pass at the toy by saying, What's happening, handsome? Come on, we're both grown up. Number 11. Adults surely love the joke that Batman works alone. Batman has to be one of the most famous superheroes there is, but he's also known for being a superhero that doesn't actually have any superpowers. Rather, he has a big team and loads of fancy equipment that turns him from Bruce Wayne into the famous world-saving hero we all know and love. While this is a pretty well-known fact among adults, it's probably not something the average kid has given much thought to. In one scene, Batman says, Batman works alone except, and proceeds to list the team of people he needs to help him do what he does, which has the makings of a joke that will likely only land for adults. Number 12. Lucius Fox is referred to as whoever Morgan Freeman played. How much about the DC Universe and where exactly you know it from varies greatly from person to person. For most kids, they likely don't know a whole lot. So when CEO of Wayne Enterprises, Lucius Fox, is known as whoever Morgan Freeman played, this is a pretty funny reference for the many folks who only know that character from watching the super popular Dark Knight trilogy. Number 13. This movie is full of DC establishments with names that are punny plays on places in the real world. There's Strikers Island, which is where captured villains go in the DC universe. In the Marvel universe, the captured villains go to Rikers Island. It's safe to say that both these names are plays on the real-life Rikers Island. And it's also safe to say that both of these jokey names are in debatably poor taste. On the other hand, there's a famous Metropolis establishment that's in good taste. Very good taste, in fact. You can see a Sun Dollar in the movie, which is DC Universe's famous coffee chain. It's based on our universe's famous coffee chain, Starbucks. Get it? Sun Dollar? Starbucks? That's clever. Number 14. Comic fans have plenty of hidden jokes to uncover in DC League of Super Pets. There are so many references to find if you're a major DC fan, and many of them are way deeper and more niche than just base knowledge of Batman and Superman. And while kids will certainly get the... They should call me Iron Man. <laughs> it is way funnier for adults who understand the implications of a Marvel pun in a DC movie. Why can I have gotten a magic hammer or something? Number 15. Some of our favorite Saturday Night Live comedians transformed into super pets for this movie. It's very common for kids' animated movies to snag the biggest and most famous cast of voice actors they can. And this move is pretty much always for the grown-ups watching the movie. In the case of DC League of Super Pets, they went with some SNL cast members that adults are surely happy to see. Or hear. Most children aren't likely to recognize the voices of SNL cast members. For parents, however, having famous funny ladies like Kate McKinnon and Vanessa Bayer as Lulu and PB will make the movie extra funny for Saturday Night Live fans. Ah! Cars on the Road is the latest installment to join the beloved Cars franchise, and fans are loving it. It's crazy! But there are plenty of moments in this Disney Plus series that are definitely made for adults. Let's check him out. Number 1. Starting with one of the most surprising elements of Cars on the Road that was made for adults only, Episode 8 is modeled in many different ways after Mad Max Fury Road. 
Oh, points for pageantry. The cars with spikes all over them definitely look familiar. Ah yes, we've seen pretty much these exact cars before. This headpiece also looks like something straight out of Mad Max. And it's pretty clear that this moment is Mad Max inspired. How come you got a flamethrower? It's pretty likely that no kids would recognize this. Or at least, we hope not. Number 2. The Shining doesn't seem like the type of movie that would be referenced in a kid-friendly show. <gasps> nope, 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 thank you. But there are actually quite a few references to the famous horror film in Cars on the Road. First, it says race car on the door, a pretty obvious Carsified reference to the red rum scene in The Shining. Later, there are two little girl cars dressed and acting exactly like the famous twins in The Shining. Come on, race with us, Later, green antifreeze pours out of the elevator, like a complimentary color version of the red blood pouring out of this elevator. That's a lot of antifreeze. Number 3. If there's any TV show with a score that's particularly popular right now, it's that iconic theme song from Stranger Things. So it's clearly no accident that when the Wayne County Cryptid Busters are looking for Bigfoot, there's music playing that sounds a lot like the famous Stranger Things theme. And since they're alien hunting, it all fits. Bigfoot. Number 4. The third episode deals a lot more with cars meeting their demise than we typically see in a kid's show. Uh-oh. And it all starts with catching a glimpse of a car in less than lively condition. Huh. A car tells Mater, We suddenly find ourselves with a rare opening on our team. And then shows a totally demolished car. No, 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 no. We are just past the fantastically. Sure, seeing a destroyed car isn't necessarily bad for kids, but when all of the cars are sentient, it makes that line a little fuzzy. <laughs> Number five. Later in the episode, Mater gets into a serious accident and has a conversation with an angel. I'll take you the rest of the way. What? Who are you? AKA the Speed Demon. About the fact that his life is over and he's about to cross over to the other side. Well. I never thought this is how you'd go out. Again, that's pretty heavy for young audiences, and kids on the younger side may even be prompted to ask some challenging questions to their grown-ups after seeing this scene. Ah, oh, well, suppose I can let one slip through the cracks. Number six. Just after this moment, Mater asks the Speed Demon if he'll ever get to say goodbye to Lightning McQueen now that he's taking a drive over that rainbow bridge. I don't even get to say goodbye? The Speed Demon asks, do you know what a seance is? This is probably a joke for the adults in the room, but again, it may prompt some questions from the kids that aren't so pleasant. Number 7. When Mater gets completely made over to be able to race, he comes out looking totally different and being capable of way more. Is this the car's version of plastic surgery? Yikes. At least he's back to his old self by the end of the episode. You got that right. <laughs> Number 8. On their journey, Lightning and Mater meet a group of cars that call themselves the Wayne County Cryptid Busters. So, what brings you around to these parts? The way they're going about their search, combined with what they're searching for, definitely makes them seem like conspiracy theorists. Secret order. Secret order? What are you talking about? Which isn't something most kids are likely to understand. Number 9. Another thing that would fly right over kids' heads? No pun intended. That joke about delivery drones. Oh! Maybe it's one of them fancy delivery drones. When they hear a buzzing noise, Mater suggests that it might be one of those fancy delivery drones. That, sir, was no delivery drone. This is definitely a joke for the grown-ups watching. Number 10. Car Hinge isn't new to Cars on the Road. The monument has appeared in the Cars franchise before. Still, kids may not know what Stonehenge is, so they might not understand that Car Hinge is a play on it and might think that it's just something that exists on its own in the Cars universe. Number 11. When Mater volunteers Lightning to participate in the circus, he says, It'll be like one of them exposure therapy things. Yeah, um, we're pretty sure most kids won't get that, but they definitely may be able to relate to Lightning's fear of clowns. Number 12. Lightning McQueen tells Mater about how the famous director, Bella Cadaver, uses practical effects instead of CGI. What's CGI? Well, Mater, that's, uh, technical. He then reveals that he doesn't really understand what CGI is and basically says that it has something to do with computers. Pretty interesting coming from an animated car, but we'll suspend our disbelief on that one. What did you think of these not-so-kid-friendly moments? Were there any other scenes or jokes that you thought were made for the adults watching? Let us know in the comments. How hilarious was it when the cutest, most innocent animal sidekick is revealed to have an absolutely filthy vocabulary? Rat face, butt nugget, 
for brains, you know, that sort of thing. Puss in Boots' The Last Wish is packed with moments like this that only adults would appreciate. Let's go find out! Wait! <laughs> Number one. We once heard a dog's mouth is supposed to be surprisingly clean. That probably wouldn't hold up in lab tests, and it's definitely not true for Perito and Puss in Boots The Last Wish. Perito may seem like the sweetest, most innocent character in this movie. I don't trust you. Me neither. He cannot be trusted. But when push comes to shove, he delivers one of the filthiest lines in the film. Well, at least we assume he does. Every other word is bleeped out, indicating a slew of filthy swear words unfit for a PG audience. Oh, munching, minky, nugget, and your snooter! <laughs> The presence of implied foul language and the use of the bleep are both things meant mostly for the adults to appreciate. Number two, get a load of this. Okay, honestly, we have absolutely no idea what actual words Perito is saying in his bleeped out rant to the Three Bears family. That actually makes it a little tamer, because if we can't figure it out, kids couldn't either. But there's really no question what Kitty Softpaws was about to say before being cut off in this dangerous flower scene. This is stupid. All I smell is bullshit. <laughs> Little kids might miss that one, but not adults. Although we think this one is really in there for the older kids who get a huge amount of satisfaction from knowing exactly what inappropriate word Kitty was about to say. Congratulations, pre preteens. Number three, we'll drink to that. We love it whenever Puss in Boots slides up to a bar and suavely, or sullenly, orders a glass of milk. All of the imaginary language and ensuing antics makes it clear to adult members of the audience that milk for cats in this world functions exactly like alcohol for humans in ours. I mean, this gato is chugging pints, throwing back shots, and in his more vulnerable moments, ordering something high quality just to sip. Kids may have a vague understanding of the concept around drinking alcohol, but specifically like another glass of cream make it your heavy are jokes tailor made for the more worldly adults in the audience number 4 he had to go there goldilocks and baby bear do not hold back on their insults for each other some of their repartee includes zingers that only adults would really understand we don't expect kids to understand how cruel and funny it is for Baby Bear to call his adopted sister a low-rent Cinderella. You're nothing but a low-rent Cinderella. But for the adults who were listening closely, this sick fairy tale burn is worth the price of admission. Number five. Some of these plot lines are pretty deep. Kids are sure to enjoy the heist, the quest for the wishing star, and the brilliantly animated slapstick and battles along the way. But the real crux of the film is actually something that might be a little too mature for most youngsters to grasp. At the end of the day, this whole movie is about Puss having a full-on existential crisis. I I'm supposed to be a fearless hero, but without lives to spare, I am nothing. At one point, he literally buries his old identity and falls into a feline depression. Luckily, he finds that life is still worth living even if his sense of self has evolved. Us grown-ups needed that happy ending after witnessing this heroic kitty spiral. Number 6. Interesting. Can you say more about that? Even if kids understand some of the humor in Perito self-identifying as a therapy dog, the truly hilarious line about therapy will only have full impact for adults. And his therapy dog! Finally! You need therapy! Puss getting called out like that by his ex is something that's only funny when you've witnessed the complexities of adult romantic relationships. Number 7. This is a sad state of affairs. Puss's life at Mama Luna's depicts the indignity of Puss's geriatric years with painful precision. Most of the jokes around this topic will go over kids' heads, like Mama Luna's concerns about a health department raid. You're not from the health department, are you? We better get you inside because, baby, they are always watching. Number 8. We hope kids aren't encountering this issue with their pediatricians. Doctors slash veterinarians slash barber slash dentist slash witch hunter that Puss sees after being crushed by a bell delivers bad news without a ton of finesse. Puss doesn't appreciate this. You really got to work on your bedside manner. Bedside manner is not a term most kids are familiar with, so we have to assume this quick dig at the doc made it in the script for the enjoyment of adults. Number 9. 
These bakers are making buns of steel. When our hilarious and unapologetically evil villain Jack Horner orders his dozen bakers to form a bridge for him, he includes the instructions, Flex the glutes, I need a solid surf. That whole concept, including the word glutes, would go over kids' heads. But it's a funny specific to adults, especially with John Mulaney's deadpan delivery. We can totally hear Andrew saying something like this on Big Mouth. Number 10. Get ready to feel old. Young kids who saw Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, when it dropped in theaters weren't even born yet when the first Puss in Boots movie came out. And most of their parents were still kids or young teens when Shrek debuted in 2001. How is that possible? We hope that parents have given kids the proper animated film education to prepare them for the references in this movie, like appearances from Jinji and Pinocchio or the Hakuna Matata motif. But if not, those cameos are for mature audiences only. Number 11. Hasta la vista, baby. If you got that reference, then you may have also been among the folks who got the Arnold Schwarzenegger reference in Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. Jack Horner's final moment sinking into the ground with thumbs up that he turns into a thumbs down is a reference to the way Arnold's Terminator goes down in Terminator 2 Judgment Day. You know, the 1991 classic that children are intimately familiar with? Yeah, no. This one was definitely for the oldest adults in the audience. Number 12. It all comes down to the wire. Today's youth are all well-versed in HBO prestige dramas of the early 2000s, right? Well, if not, then it was probably only the adults who noticed that the wolf's whistle in Puss in Boots' The Last Wish was referencing Omar's warning call as he stalked the streets of Baltimore in the TV show The Wire. Number 13. Not the bees! Definitely don't think as we're picking up on this meme-fied Nick Cage reference. Actually, most adults probably even missed it. But for those who caught the quick line of the dialogue featuring Baby Bear crying out, no! Not a bees! Just like Cage's character in the cringe-inducing remake of The Wicker Man, it's an extremely satisfying deep cut. Number 14. Is it Jiminy or Jimmy? The world may never know. Kids will get that this bug is supposed to mirror Jiminy Cricket from Pinocchio, but only adults will notice that his voice seems to be a pitch-perfect impression of actor Jimmy Stewart. Maybe we need to dig a little deeper. T t tell me about your childhood. Just remember this, Mr. Potter, that this rabble you're talking about. Whether this was an intentional reference to the fine, upstanding moral characters Stuart was known for portraying, or just a failed attempt to impersonate the voice of Pinocchio's conscious from the Disney cartoon, we'll never know. But either way, that's a question only adults will be leaving the theater with. Do you love it as much as we do when kids' films include jokes and references geared for adults? Let us know which grown-up only moment was your favorite in the comments. And suppose he actually breathes fire? No, he squirts toothpaste. Most of us enjoyed the Fairly Odd Parents as kids, but that doesn't mean that every joke landed for us. We've compiled the many jokes that were aimed at adults that probably went over most kids' heads. One to be the list. Let's get into it. Number 1. There's an episode of the Fairly Odd Parents called Croc Blocked, and that title in and of itself seems just a bit on the adult side. The title does tie into the episode as well when an entire classroom of children sees Crocker entirely naked. Kids watching the show at home, though, are spared the sight of a completely nude person since Crocker has his, you know what, blocked by his desk and then by a stack of papers. Otherwise, this episode would have been in an entirely different category of made for adults. Number 2. Croc Blocked is far from the only episode on the Fairly Odd Parents that overtly references that area of the body. There's an episode from season 9 titled Anchors Away that has some moments that are more than fit for this list. In this episode, Cosmo sports a skirt in the desert and seems taken with how freeing it feels to go sans pants. I'm totally flying out of fresco under my skirt! In doing so, he makes multiple references to his cha-chas. Timmy, the breeze tickles my cha-chas! While we may typically think that cha-chas would be a euphemism for something located on the upper body, Cosmo is using them to refer to, well, under his skirt. He specifically likes how the breeze hits that area. Number 3. And as it turns out, he's probably getting quite the breeze. It's clear that Cosmo isn't just wearing a skirt. He's going commando under there. We know this because later in the episode he bends over and seems to accidentally moon everyone. Who? A penny! Ah! Which makes for another rather risque moment for a kid's show. Number 4. 
Ah yes, there are more references to that particular part of One's Anatomy, and this time it is flat out referred to as Big Nuts. The episode Who's Your Daddy has quite a few references to Big Nuts, since Timmy is after a Squirrely Scouts trophy that, in Wanda's own words, is one big nut. Suffice it to say, there are plenty of opportunities for jokes about nut size that allow kids to watch and believe that everyone's just referring to a literal nut, while adults probably tend to think differently. You're in a nut-free zone. You must land. Oh, nuts. Number five. The Squirrely Scouts supply us with another moment that is even more overtly inappropriate than the last. Mr. Turner says that if he drives around a group of boys in a short uniform, he'll be arrested. If I drive a group of boys to the movies in this outfit, they'll arrest me! And while this is a funny and surprising line for adults, we doubt younger audiences would have the slightest idea about why this would get Mr. Turner in trouble with the law. Number 6. In another episode, Timmy's dad makes yet another off-color comment, this time about Timmy's internet usage. Mr. Turner sees that Timmy has a picture of Mr. Crocker wearing a dress on his computer and tells Timmy that he's supposed to steer clear of those kind of websites. You're not supposed to be on those kinds of websites! But that's my teacher! Parental controls have probably prevented young viewers from knowing what kind of websites he's referring to, but hey, you never know. Well, it does make him look pretty. Number 7. Throughout the Fairly Odd Parents, it seemed that Timmy's parents had a great relationship. Yet, based on her reaction to this anniversary gift, we get the idea that Mrs. Turner thinks there's a little something to be desired. Which is a problem because I'm about to drown in my own tears! She opens her eyes to see that she's blindfolded before receiving her gift, but she thinks the blindfold is the gift and is thrilled with it. It's a blindfold! Oh, I've always wanted one! Why would someone have always wanted a blindfold as an anniversary gift? Number 8. Oh good, there's another nuts joke. This time Mr. Turner says, It's hard to keep nuts in your mouth when you're crying. Of course he's got actual nuts in his mouth, but the Fairly Odd Parents now has a well-established propensity for nut jokes, and this one is even a bit more involved than the others. Number 9. Baby Poof has a very not-safe-for-work toy in the shape of a squid. Yeah, it's definitely a squid. Poof has a questionable-looking squid toy that squirts toothpaste and does a toothpaste shot right on Timmy's face. This joke is really pushing it, and right in front of baby Poof, no less. Number 10. In one episode, Timmy is an adult, and he learns the hard lesson that there are things that you can get away with as a kid that you simply cannot do as an adult. Cosmo and Wanda tell adult Timmy that it's creepy when an adult helps an old woman across the street, and he ends up getting pepper sprayed. <laughs> Poor Timmy didn't know, because he really is just a kid. And kids watching at home wouldn't get this quite yet, either. Number 11. A crab version of Timmy's Aunt Gertrude says she's going to pinch his chubby cheeks. Nothing too risque there. Crabs love pinching, and aunts love pinching cheeks. But when Timmy implies that he hopes the cheeks on his face are the ones Aunt Gertrude is talking about, I hope she means my face! Things get a little more on the inappropriate side. Number 12. In one episode, Timmy has some insight about his future therapy that few children have the foresight to see at the moment. Timmy's dad is conversing with a puppet version of his mom, and Timmy is already aware that this is too weird for inevitable therapy later in life to help him reconcile with. No amount of therapy will ever make this moment okay. As adults, we know that Timmy is probably absolutely right. Number 13. It just wouldn't be an adult jokes in a kid's show list without a good Uranus joke. I'm being sent on a 23-year trip to Uranus, which turns out to be a planet. Mr. Turner is surprised that Uranus is the name of a planet, and that's just the start of the moments in this episode where butts are the butt of the joke. Number 14. In another episode, Cosmo gets some rather surprising plastic surgery. I thought you said plastic surgery! He says he got plastic surgery and appears to have had a breast augmentation. He's also apparently happy with it, so good for him. I'm keeping them. Number 15. Apparently Cosmo and Wanda were once fairy godparents to the person who caused World War I. Let's backtrack a little. In the Season 5 episode, Hassle in the Castle, Timmy finds the Hall of Infamy, which has paintings of the children who Cosmo and Wanda previously acted as fairy godparents for. Timmy meets Marianne, who apparently caused World War I. You abused our magic, then plunged the world into World War I! Yeah? 
Sure, it's easy to see how having magic at your disposal as a kid could cause quite a lot of problems, but apparently Marianne really went wild, and we can't imagine that many kids really understand what exactly this means. Number 16. It's clear that Mr. Turner's dreams have been destroyed, at least based on this very literal visual representation. In one episode, Timmy drops his dad's box of dreams and shatters it, and Mr. Turner implies that his dreams were already destroyed when Timmy was born. Don't worry about it, Timmy. My dreams were shattered years ago. How many years ago? How old are you? Hopefully this comment went over Timmy's head like it did with the kids watching. Otherwise, that scathing comment is sure to be yet another thing Timmy will be struggling to cope with in therapy. Number 17. In the Fairly Odd Parents universe, there's a version of the popular TV show Dr. Phil, but in this case, it's Dr. Bill. And he has a lot of hair instead of, well, you know. Kids may not get this reference, but they're certainly not going to get the references Dr. Bill makes in his bad parent test. He talks about kids taking many paper towels up to their rooms and needing a lot of privacy. Do they use a lot of paper towels, spend too much time alone in their rooms, and say, don't bother me? Of course, in Timmy's case, he's always got some fairy godparent-related hijinks going on that he wants to keep from his parents. But if other young people of a certain age were doing this, well, let's just say hopefully they're locking their door. I'm just gonna take these paper towels up to my room alone, so don't bother me. Oh, no! Did you ever catch these adults-only jokes? Are there any that you remember that we missed? We want to hear all about it in the comments. Here, come on, kick my butt. Ouch, ooh, ouch. We all know that plenty of adults are major fans of Adventure Time. What we may not have realized is just how many jokes this show made that were for adults only. We've got them all, so let's get into it. Number one, Lump Off. Oh, sorry, not you. What, you think I'm gonna turn all lumpy like her? Get out of here. We were just quoting Lumpy Space Princess, who likes to replace swear words with the word lump. She says things like, what the lump, and lump off, and honestly, we think this is a pretty good way of censoring your lingo. Her parents apparently think lump may as well be an actual swear word, though. What did you just say? I said lump off, mom, lump like off. They punish her for saying it all the same. Even lumpy parents just don't understand. Shucks, I lumping hate them. Number two. In one episode, Finn actually finds himself on a rather R-rated date. Simon, make it romantic. In To Cut a Woman's Hair, Finn is after a lock of Princess Bubblegum's hair. He decides to get close to her by taking her out on a date, for hair obtaining purposes only, of course. During their date, though, Finn says a few things that grown-ups may interpret as questionable. At one point, he says, Put your butt here! Hurry! And at another point, he says, Here! Shove this in your mouth! It's hot! About spaghetti, of course. Okay, it's technically kid-friendly, but Michael Scott wouldn't be able to resist. That's what she said! <laughs> Number three. This bizarre bounce house sequence is definitely a bit strange in nature. Finn is about to enter a bounce house, only to realize that said bounce house is actually a princess. When he apologizes for nearly entering her, the bounce house princess encourages him to come in and You wanna go inside? Bounce around for a little? Yikes. Number four, Jake seems to like feet just a little bit extra. In the episode aptly named Freak City, things get just a bit freaky. Finn is turned into a massive foot. Instead of being freaked out by this transformation, though, Jake seems strangely interested, even telling Finn that he may want to stay that way. When Finn wonders why exactly, Jake suggests, You'll understand when you're older. If you are older, you definitely get what Jake is hinting at. Number 5. It's slapping time. King Zergiok enjoys slapping the behinds of his subjects, which in and of itself is interesting. He refers to this as spanking time, and seems to do it for the sole purpose of his own personal enjoyment. Number 6. As a gaming console, sometimes things need to go into BMO's ports. BMO says that things need to be plugged into a particular port that's located in the back area. Yes, Finn. It goes in my Oh. This is almost certainly funny even for kids watching, but for adults, the meaning is just a little different. Number 7. Lady Rainicorn and Jake are totally into psychedelics. Yeah. In one episode, Lady Rainicorn asks Jake, do you remember when we got completely naked and frantically floated around in the farmer's cabbage patch? That has to be some kind of drug thing, right? 
Either way, really, we think there are some things about Jake and Lady Rainicorn's relationship that are very adults only. Number 8. Do not do tier 15. Sorry, just quoting Jake. Do not do tier 15! What was he talking about, you ask? Well, it's kind of like Jake's own personal version of the dating version of baseball bases. Jake has a specific tier system when it comes to dating. It goes through the tiers from hugging to smooching to touching her horn for the very first time. Very special. When Finn asks about tier 15, Jake shouts, do not do tier 15. Seeing as tier 5 was exploring the other person's stomach, we really don't want to know what tier 15 is. Number 9. Jake has made a very interesting tape, and we think it may be X-rated. When Lady Rainicorn finds a video all about fighting demons, they notice that Jake has recorded over some parts of the video with some interesting footage. It starts with Jake posing in front of a fireplace. Hey, lady, you asked me to make you a video. Primo, skip! Lucky for all of us, and for the sake of Adventure Time's rating, Finn fast-forwards through the rest of the video. We do get to see the end of the video, though. Okay, I love you, girl. I hope you liked it. Bye. Number 10. Turns out Finn may be a bit of a peeping Tom. Er, peeping Finn. Finn totally walks in on Marceline the Vampire Queen and sees her in, well, her full vampire form. What happened, man? I'm not going back out there. Oh, Finn, we know what you're doing, and it's definitely not okay. Number 11. Can a human have a keys, baby? Obviously not, but that doesn't mean Finn isn't going to try. Or at least that's what he says. In one episode, Finn is in search of a key, and when he finds it, hey, we all know the feeling of finally finding something we've been searching for. But telling it we're meant to be and saying we want to have its baby? That's a bit much. And it's definitely a bit much for a show that's supposed to be kid-friendly. Number 12. Gunter the Penguin has some rather strange behavior in one episode. Gunter pecks at Jake's head, but we're pretty sure it's supposed to look like something entirely different is happening. Why does it look like this? We have no idea, and we really don't want to know. Gunter! Jake! No! Number 13. Finn says that he's an ant about to get in someone's pants. This ant's about to get in his pants! What? Obviously, this moment is a mistake on Finn's part, but judging by how hard he's blushing when he says he's going to get in someone's pants, we have a feeling that he knows exactly how that sounded. Number 14. This is some especially slimy spooning coming from these slimes. When I say go, the big spoon will put his arm around the little spoon and cuddle. In this episode, Finn is in a spooning contest. Okay, spooning isn't exactly inappropriate for kids, even though it does tend to have some other connotations. Yet, those slime balls there seem to us to be doing something just a little bit more inappropriate than your average wholesome spooning. Number 15. Ice King has a rather interesting... interest? He likes to capture princesses and tie them up. Then he forces them to marry him, because, you know, it wasn't crazy enough before. And while it's pretty clear that tying up others is Ice King's preferred hobby, it seems that he also likes getting tied up himself. In the episode, I Remember You, the Ice King falls and accidentally ties himself up in some cords. You know, I kind of like being tied up in these cords. He seems suspiciously happy to be there, almost as if he wants to be tied up. Now, why might that be? We can't imagine. Number 16. Hunson Abadir is just plain disturbing. Hunson is Marceline the Vampire Queen's dad, and he just so happens to rule over the Nidosphere. At first glance, sure, maybe we should go a little easier on the guy than calling him disturbing. That said, things change a bit when he does one of his favorite pastimes, sucking souls. He then turns into this monster, and suffice it to say, he looks a lot like something out of a particularly graphic human anatomy textbook. The mouth, the beard, it's a little too uncanny for our taste. He also offers pain, pleasure, or weird punishment. And... come on. We don't even want to get into the irony of all that. All we know is, his look is definitely no accident. Look, just get in here. <laughs> Number 17. In a moment not entirely unrelated to Hunson Abadir's look is the Duchess of Nuts. In the episode The Duke, we're introduced to the Duke and Duchess of Nuts. Unlike Hunson Abadir, we're willing to overlook the Duchess's appearance, except maybe that nut on top of her head. But when she repeatedly talks about her husband lying with her, we know that the Duchess of Nuts isn't an entirely innocent character. Would you like to hear what my nuts have to say? Did you notice just how not kid-friendly some of Adventure Time's jokes were? 
Did you notice any that we didn't include? Tell us about them in the comments, and if you love videos like this, make sure to like and subscribe to The Things Animated for lots more videos like this one.